From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 84, recorded on November 3rd, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to talk about Paul's latest column called Who Will Save Our Children? So what are you referring to by that title? You're not talking about saving them politically, are you? <laughs> no. What I mean is that this year has been hard for children. We've had a measles epidemic that's bigger than anything we've had in 33 years. We've had three people die of measles, including two healthy little girls, six and eight-year-old girls in West Texas. We've had almost 300 deaths in children from influenza. We haven't seen a number that big since 2009, the last flu pandemic. We've had children dying in states from whooping cough or pertussis that haven't, uh, those states haven't seen deaths in years. So children are suffering this anti-vaccine backlash. And the question is, who's going to stand up to save them? Who? Who is going to stand up and say, this is enough? We need to vaccinate our children. I mean, if we had a secretary of health and human services who was doing his job, he would use his famous name and his now position to stand up and say, we need to vaccinate our children. These children are dying unnecessarily and it's unconscionable, but he doesn't. You, you In the article, you point out a number of things that he's done, which show that he's not going to be the savior. Maybe you could go through some of those. Yeah, so, so, so during this measles epidemic, he appeared on national television and said that measles vaccine causes blindness, measles vaccine causes deafness, measles vaccine kills children every year, um, that measles vaccine causes the same symptoms as measles. So that right there should have ended his tenure as Secretary of Health and Human Services, but he didn't. There are adverse events from the vaccine. It does cause deaths every year. It causes it causes all the illnesses that measles itself causes, encephalitis and blindness, et cetera. Um, he withdrew $500, $500 million from the, the Biomedical Advanced uh, Research Development Authority, which you know will hurt our preparedness for future pandemics. He basically canceled the United States commitment to the Global Alliance Vaccine Initiative, which for 25 years has vaccinated probably a billion children and saved almost 20 million lives. Um, he has, um, in addition to that, he's um, stood up uh, in a one-minute video on X and said healthy young children don't need a vaccine, even though a child who's never been vaccinated or naturally infected does benefit from a vaccine. He has said that pregnant women don't need to be vaccinated when we're the only country in the world that's ever said that because it is a high-risk condition. All these things have happened, and Congress certainly has never stood up. Um, Senator Cassie said that he was going to have a, in his words, quote, an unprecedentedly close working relationship with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Senator, Senator Cassie is an adult gastroenterologist. He certainly knows the value of hepatitis B vaccine. Nonetheless, he's watching the current ACIP, which it's hard for me to call them the ACIP. They're more like the fake ACIP, say that they're going to look at whether or not we still should be vaccinating uh, ch children uh, and as uh, you know, for as a birth dose with hepatitis B vaccine. So it's still nothing is ever said. So who's going to stand up? Who's going to save us? Don't forget he trashed both CDC and ACIPS to the point where no one trusts it anymore. That's right. Medical and scientific groups no longer look to the ACIP and no longer look to the CDC advice. They formed their own committees, either at the state level or society level, formed their own committees to, to establish good medical practices, worked with insurance companies to make sure that there's insurance companies. We basically now don't look to the ACIP or CDC anymore. So recently he testified before the Senate. And how would you characterize his uh, testimony there? He knows that, that he is able to do whatever he wants with impunity, that he's that they, whether uh, uh, people in the House of Representatives or, or Senate really don't have any hold over him. So he treats them with disdain. He's I'm happy and, to, and to we, have a detailed we discussion with you we, about we, it. You're so wrong you're on your facts. You're, you're interrupting me. He talks over them. He shouts at them. He shows no respect at all for the senators or congressmen in front of whom he testifies because he knows there's only one person he needs to satisfy and who would that be? And that would be President Donald Trump. So then would will President Trump stand up for America's children? 
No. And you knew that from 10 years ago. I mean, during a Republican primary debate debate in 2015, President, the soon-to-be president, Donald Trump, um, said that um, vaccines are, are overwhelming our children, that they're given at horse-level doses, that they're getting too much, and that we need to lessen the amount of vaccines that they're getting, that we need to space them out. He said this 10 years ago. I want smaller doses over a longer period of time. And you pump, I mean, it looks just like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. Two years old, two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. So he's an anti-vaccine activist in many ways. And now during that, that uh, famous Tylenol conference when uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. claimed falsely that, that Tylenol given in pregnancy in doubled the risk of autism, which he's now backing away from. Um, but he said that at the time. And there was Donald Trump, you know, with a post saying that we needed to not give the hepatitis B vaccine until children were 12 years of old of age and they were fully formed, that we need to separate the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine into its three component parts, thus echoing things that Andrew Wakefield said back in uh, 1998, that if you separate the MMR vaccine, you'll lessen the risk of autism, even though MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism. So why would separating it out into its three component parts make a difference? So he, I think the thing that said it to me, Jim O'Neill is the current acting director of the CDC. He put out a post that said, uh, thanking President Trump for his excellent leadership, and then said, we need to separate the MMR vaccine into its three component parts. That's Donald Trump. That's not RFK Jr. So Donald Trump is not going to be the person who saves us. What, what, what did Trump base his evidence on saying MMR should be broken into three components? When Andrew Wakefield published his paper in The Lancet in February of 1998, claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism, it, was, it wasn't a study. It was just a case series of eight children who had received the vaccine and then within a month of receiving the vaccine had supposedly developed signs and symptoms of autism. Now, 24 separate studies done in seven countries on three continents involving hundreds of thousands of children have shown that that's not true, that you're at no greater risk of getting autism if you got that vaccine or if you didn't. But Andrew Wakefield stood up at a press conference later and said, if you want to lessen the risk of autism, you need to separate that vaccine into its three component parts. That gave birth to the notion that you could lessen autism by doing that. Now, that didn't make any sense. First of all, MMR doesn't cause autism, so why would separating it into its three component parts lessen the risk of autism? But that's what that, that sort of gave birth to that notion. And, you know, it's not hard to scare people. It's much um, harder to unscare them. So all those studies, those 24 studies, has completely caused that notion to disappear, and, and uh, Donald Trump has embraced it. All right. And then he, he said also in the, in the tweet, the X post that you put in your column, he said, don't give ch Tylenol to your young child. Well, that wasn't even what was being discussed, was it? No, he said, he said, I think he said, don't give Tylenol, Tylenol I thought, to, to, the, um, to the mother uh, who is pregnant, that she needs to just gut it out, that, um, you know, if she's having symptoms and she's trying to treat those symptoms, just gut it out, hold back, come on, mom, stay, stay tough. Thus again, bringing us back to the time when we blamed mothers for their child's autism, and he just basically re-energized that whole notion. So here's the, t the, the post, I uh, have it up. Pregnant women don't use Tylenol unless absolutely necessary. Don't give Tylenol to your young child for virtually any reason. I hadn't seen that. that that's interesting. So, so, so he believes that that autism occurs in utero, which actually is true, but has nothing to do with Tylenol. Um, and that even if you're after you're born or you have a young child, but five year old, ten year old, that you uh, still shouldn't give them Tylenol. I, I mean, I really do think. Uh, the company that makes Tylenol should stand up for itself, show the data that disproves this false notion and help us move forward. What's wrong with giving hep B vaccine at 12 months instead of right after birth? Did he say 12 months or 12 years? Oh my gosh, let me check that. Let's see. Uh, 12 years. Oh my gosh, he said 12 years old. He can't spell hepatitis either. Okay, we'll give him that. But yes, he says 12 years old. So if you... If you um, Get hepatitis B uh, infection in the first year of life, you have a 90% chance of going on to develop cirrhosis or liver cancer, which is why we have a birth dose of hepatitis B. If you get hepatitis B in the first five years of life, you have a 25 to 30% chance of going on to develop cirrhosis, which is chronic liver disease or liver cancer. So why are we waiting till 12 years of age? Beats me. If you get a hepatitis B as an adult or even an older adolescent, 
you have really a 5% or less chance of developing cirrhosis or liver cancer. So he wants to wait to give Tylenol or whatever, or I'm sorry, he wants to wait to give the hepatitis B vaccine until 12 years of age. Makes no sense. Then he also said in that post, make sure you, you give kids vaccines in five separate medical visits, okay? What's the science behind that? None. It's This has been around for a while, the notion that children are getting too many vaccines too soon. And it's understandable. We do ask a lot of parents in this country. We do ask them in the first few years of life to get vaccines and prevent 14 different diseases. That can mean as many as five shots at one time. It can mean as many as 25 shots during that time, first few years of life. And to prevent diseases, most people don't see using biological fluids. Most people don't understand. So I, I get the pushback, but it doesn't in any sense help to delay vaccines. All you're doing is increasing the period of time during which children are susceptible to these viruses or bacteria with no benefit. So given all this, is the U.S. public still behind vaccination? Yes, that's the encouraging news. Most parents, if you put the COVID vaccine aside, most parents support vaccines and they support vaccine uh, school entry requirements. Um, independent of whether they're, they're Republicans or Democrats or independents, most parents fully support vaccines. And I just wish in the end, maybe they're the ones who can save us. They're the ones who are going to stand up and let their voices be heard and reverberate throughout Congress to let congressmen know this is not OK. And we're not going to vote for people who don't stand up for our children. In fact, tomorrow, November 4th, people have an opportunity to make their voices heard. Well, when this um, recording goes up, it will be passed, but it's election day. Just vote with your, speak with your vote, folks. Right. But, you know, Paul, we've been talking about vaccines and infectious diseases. Public health is also about making sure people are properly nourished and they have affordable health care both of which are being taken away by this administration. That's right. You look at the SNAP benefits about, upon which many people rely, and um, this is all only going to make us less healthy at a time when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says that he is going to make America healthy again. And if they do get sick, they won't be able to afford proper medical treatment. I know. It's just going to get worse, and so we need to stand up. Stand up for ourselves, stand up for our children, stand up for the public's health, which is to say our family's health and our neighbor's health. We need to care about them. My feeling, Paul, is that this administration does not care about the health of this nation in general because wealthy people can take care of themselves. That's right. Wealthy people can afford it. If things get more and more expensive, they're going to be the, the, the last ones to be hurt. And of course, wealthy people will make sure they are vaccinated, right? Generally, <laughs> although I definitely know wealthy people who are on the anti-vaccine side. Well, there's a good way to cure that, and that's to get an infectious disease. All right, we'll put a link to Paul's column in the show notes so you can read everything with the proper links to the original stories. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 